Thank you for that introduction, John. Um, so as mentioned, I'll be going over building strong enterprise and business architecture foundations. So um, we'll talk about how you can build a strong foundation for an enterprise architecture practice, how you can set the stage for success as you set up and mature an enterprise architecture practice, and what it looks like for an enterprise architect to be successful from when building from an immature enterprise architecture practice. And just to give a bit of a background about Evolution, um, as you may already know, Evolution has been in the EA space for 21 years. And in the seven years that I've been with the company, I've been able to see the company grow into its current state with offices worldwide and thousands of Abacus users. Now, I'll back up a bit to give a little bit of extra context around the topic. Now, enterprise architecture was once viewed solely as a concern for tech companies or IT departments and even perceived as a side discipline for some, but that's really changing. According to Gartner, 60% of businesses will depend on enterprise architecture's role to inform their approach to digital innovation in 2023. And enterprise architect was actually named as the number one job of 2022 by Glassdoor. So enterprise architects have this challenge of building up a mature EA practice, oftentimes from humble beginnings. So that might be something like starting from just the scraps of solution architecture, some project work, some IT discipline, maybe something very diagram driven and needing to mature that until it is a self-service enterprise architecture that is collaborative and value driven. And of course, we can talk about how to build strong architecture foundations in generic terms and the steps along the way to build up EA maturity. But I think we'll get a lot more out of it with a tangible example. And so we're going to draw on an example from the real world. Now, this example is anonymized and generalized, but it is based on experiences with real customers. So for this example, Radha is an enterprise architect at an insurance company. And that insurance company is just starting to establish a formal enterprise architecture practice. So she needs to start by learning what activities are already taking place that are enterprise architecture adjacent. And this will help set her focus. So first, she looks into how leadership reviews PowerPoint presentations that lay out strategic plans regarding capabilities. Now, they aren't necessarily using the language of capabilities, but it is close to that. Now, a problem with this is it's static. It needs to be redone every year, but it's a point in time when they have those conversations. At the same time, IT is always trying to get a handle on application and technology evaluations and determine what is out of date. But these teams struggle to know which applications to compare to each other, what, how, to, how to evaluate them, and what timelines they're looking at. Another thing that is occurring is that during project planning, solution architecture builds out reports with details about the solution being implemented. But these are static views that are often disconnected from the strategy level and from the evaluations that we just spoke about. Now, Radha was able to take these as inputs, as priorities, and bring these disparate sources and reports together into one central source. This meant that each activity was able to offer more value and insight without any additional effort from the stakeholders and contributors. As a result, capability strategy reporting now happens in a dynamic dashboard with application ratings and associated projects informing the capability evaluations and roadmaps. Application analysis was brought to the forefront and project details and the solution architecture reporting content is now in a single place alongside strategic information and application evaluations. Now, Bronho was able to do this with the following steps. First, she identified her audiences and their needs. So she understood what she needed to deliver to them. Then she leveraged frameworks. This saved a lot of time and she was able to bring together a variety of frameworks to accelerate the practice 
and create a collaborative space for her users to work in where they were comfortable with the structure and with the guardrails in place. And so doing this, she enabled collaboration for the users, allowing them to build out a repository with data and diagrams. From this repository, Ratha could do analysis and communicate the results out to her audiences. So let's understand these steps in a bit more detail to see how we can replicate Ratha's success. The first step, identify the audience. So, of course, the audience is important. This is how we, who we are reporting to. And in reality, it's generally going to be identifying your audiences, plural. Usually you'll have different groups with different reporting needs. And in the example, Radha was successful because she understood how her colleagues worked, their perspectives, and what their needs were. So here's some example audiences that you might have at your organization. One might be executives who want to see KPIs, cost calculations, and other business impacting information. Another could be teams and people who want to consume technology, digital and data services, and they might, might want this broken down by business services and workflows. Another group could be teams and people who consume technology, digital, and, uh, and or teams and stakeholders, you often seek more detailed communication. And once your audience is identified, you need to understand their information needs. This means what information they need, when to deliver it, which communication formats are easiest for them to use, and who they are going to report this information to. Now, this is something we're going to come back to when we talk about communication. However, I think it's important to lay this out at the beginning, as this should be setting your direction and determining your priorities from the very start. Delivering what is needed, to whom, when, and in the correct format, that is what is going to make your EA practice seem essential or be known as the essential practice that it is, rather than just being seen as superfluous. The second step was leveraging frameworks. Frameworks and standards provide a key way to accelerate enterprise architecture activities. The meta model will be the foundation for documenting relationships between components in your architecture, and it provides an understanding of how an organization's systems and assets are logically structured and connected. At the same time, the meta model needs to be able to stretch to support your use cases and goals and enable collaborators to model as needed. So a good approach is to use a base meta model from a framework that can be expanded to ensure the approach fulfills your key use cases. So I recommend making the most of existing features within a variety of meta models or industry specific frameworks. Now TOGAF and Archimate, both of which Abacus has certified support for, are great choices for the base meta model framework. In Radha's case, she used TOGAF as the backbone and expanded the process modeling layer by seamlessly incorporating BPMN. She also leveraged the BizBot capability model and some cloud icon libraries. Because she was leveraging Abacus, the process component in BPMN and the process component in TOGAF could be merged, gluing the two frameworks together. And we actually have a great presentation from our digital summit, which covers this concept in more detail, which is called using knowledge graphs to present multiple language modeling. And this was presented by the EA team at SRV for all. Anyway, by incorporating BPMN into TOGAF and extending the solution architecture viewpoints, adding in custom properties, and so on, Radha gave her collaborators an environment that they were comfortable collaborating in. So she created a space where they were drawing diagrams and working with the data in a way where they were comfortable and used to that structure. And this leads us to enabling collaboration. Rod has set up a flexible, collaborative repository that could grow with the use cases and grow with the users. She set up the structure in terms of combining frameworks and setting permissions. So, so she set the guardrails so that the users could seamlessly collaborate 
following a structure in order to collaborate effectively. And this meant that there was a single place where users were populating applications to capability relationships, doing evaluations on applications on technology, building out solution models and more. This brings us to the next stage, building out the repository with that data and diagrams. So an initial step to building out the repository is generally pulling in data and connecting data sources is really a key way to start to produce that one stop shop, that single source of truth for your stakeholders. And this makes updates easier, analysis more reliable and accessible and so on. So adapters and integrations can be key to this as well as round tripping data, manual updates and so on. And a configure and build meta model is really key as it allows all of these different sources to be incorporated. So some possible sources of data include CMDBs such as ServiceNow, online sources like Technopedia, other web sources or databases and external systems, as well as sources such as Excel, Word, Google Sheets, SharePoint, or Visio. These are just some examples. In Radha's case, she pulled in application and technology lists and determined that they would be mastered in Abacus. And while we certainly could load data from all possible sources, we do want to make sure we're prioritizing the right sources of data. And so to do this, and to do this effectively, we asked some enterprise architects about how they ensure their data remains current and trustworthy. And so they had some recommendations. One recommendation was to focus on data which is validated and useful. And I really want to focus on the useful aspect here. Of course, we could pull in all data just because we have it, and that can be really tempting to do sometimes. But we want to make sure that the data that we're focusing on is relevant for our audience's needs, relevant for the analysis that we need to do, and the outputs that are focused on business outcomes. By doing this, you'll be able to stay more focused and do a better job ensuring that the data is also validated. We also want to consider which data might become outdated quickly. Now, that might be a reason to avoid bringing in that data, or it might simply be an opportunity to find a better process for keeping that data up to date. Maybe that's a way of assigning owners to that data, or perhaps building out an integration with another system. Another tip is to avoid data where there's no ownership of the content after it has been created. A lack of ownership makes it more difficult to figure out who's in charge and to ensure that there are processes in place to update it. Speaking of which, there were several recommendations that it, when it came to content authors outside of the architecture team. And so we'll get into that here. So first, they recommended leveraging structure in the data. This could be pick lists or attachments. Having structure in the data makes the data easier to maintain, and it makes it easier to analyze and report on later on because it has consistency to it. Another recommendation was to make the most of permissions and constraints. Permissions and constraints both serve as guardrails to the users so that they are editing exactly what they should be, exactly how they should be. So an example of permissions that might be applied could be a case where you want users to be able to update the application portfolio. And as part of that, they need to connect the applications to the capabilities, but they're not business architects and you don't want them updating the capabilities themselves. Permissions can be leveraged so that they can update applications and update the relationship between an application and a capability, but not touch the capability itself. Constraints also serve as a guardrail to be able to ensure that the users are editing data as they should be. So this might be something like making sure that certain properties are enforced so they have to fill it out or ensuring that the correct relationship is used when connecting to components. Another recommendation was to set up housekeeping sessions to ensure content is being managed and curated effectively. 
Now, a housekeeping session might not be the right fit for you and your content owners, but I think this speaks to a broader recommendation, which is to set up processes that are going to be effective and going to serve the needs for, um, uh, for keeping the data up to date. So all of this allows us to democratize enterprise architecture. So keep in mind that the data updates and access don't need to stay within your core architecture team or within IT. Browser-based catalogs help to bridge the gap between IT and the wider business, allowing users from other departments beyond IT uh, to easily access and edit their data in real time. Diagrams can also be a key way to collaborate and build out the repository. And when the diagrams that we're working with are in a collaborative EA repository, they bring additional value and benefits. One benefit is structure and consistency. So in Radha's case for her process modelers, she leveraged BPMN. And so this provides structure to them as they build out that process model. But being within an EA tool, that structure is actually a lot easier to follow than in an unstructured tool such as Visio. When you're in an EA tool, the rules are really set up for you. So we can even see here in this example, as you drag out those connections, you're only going to have the options to connect to things that are valid to connect to and only create things in a way that follows the rules of the BPMN structure. And so in this way, it actually makes it a lot easier for users to work in the tool and a lot easy, easier for them to follow a structure that leads to actual consistency. Alongside that, we have data reuse. So as users are building on a diagram, they're actually building out the underlying repository. They're adding components, they're adding connections to that underlying data set. And at the same time, they can reuse existing data. So they could pull on an application, for example, that's already part of the application portfolio and that is being managed by a data owner. This also means that they can have inherited updates. So when those applications are being updated by those application owners, for example, that is going to have those changes, those property updates, heat mapping, et cetera, that will come through to the diagram as well. Now, when we are encouraging users to diagram, such as solution architects, they might have some specific needs. And the better that we can provide for those specific needs with customizable stencils, with modern diagramming approaches, the happier they are going to be to actually use the collaborative tool to build those diagrams and not just sink back to their kind of one off siloed places where they might diagram otherwise. For example, solution architects might need to build out cloud diagrams, such as in this example where we have an Amazon Web Services uh, cloud infrastructure diagram being built out. And so if you have a tool where you are able to incorporate those libraries, incorporate that iconography into your repository because it is flexible, then you are going to be able to future-proof your enterprise architecture practice. Now, all of this content is going into the same repository. The content being built out from diagrams, the content being updated in lists by content owners, and the content that is being pulled in via integrations and imports. It's all going into one place and can all be interconnected so it can be analyzed together and followed along in a query. And this advantage also means that we can actually leverage diagrams as a tool for communication, even if building diagrams is not important to your EA practice. Heat mapped diagrams can be a powerful communication mechanism and when your enterprise architecture tool allows you to heat map by any field, such as a calculated field or custom field, then this can be really important to communicating to your stakeholders. Now, Radha leveraged heat mapping on capabilities to highlight the way that the application evaluations and other strategic inputs 
impacted the capability model and has created a compelling view for her audience. So all of this can be done even if diagramming isn't really a part of how you work. Now, a user could also drill down from here into another diagram such as what we see here and this is actually an auto-generated view so again if you have users just contributing data in lists or just importing data integrating with different sources you can still have a tool produce output such as this auto-generated view and that gives you another way to communicate to your audiences Now, another key uh, reason why we want all of our data in a single repository and all interconnected is the ability to analyze it. This is a great opportunity that we have once the data is in one place. And algorithms are key for analyzing data. With algorithms, we can do things like take basic information on applications and turn that into a business fit score. We could attribute properties of dependencies in order to evaluate our capability model, or we could summarize IT costs at a business relevant level. Algorithms are powerful because they allow us to take interdependencies and complexities and distill that into something understandable and actionable. A key part of this is being able to do analysis across domains, which was something that Radha took advantage of to evaluate a few areas. So for example, application and technology roadmaps could be looked at together. We can attribute life cycle properties across these two, and so that can inform the roadmap of the other domain. Application health could also be rolled up to the business capability level and application controls for security could be compared against security controls needed for the data that that application accesses. And key to Radha's work, all of the inputs that enable a capability could go in as factors to the capability evaluations. And all of this is not only something that is happening within one domain, but across domains, again, because of that ability to use algorithms in that shared repository. Now, we have really been talking about doing work in a current state, and what we've been talking about so far is more along the lines of what Radha would have done initially when she was first getting everything set up and first working towards that communication with stakeholders. But we can add another level of analysis by introducing target states. Target states allow us to take the suggested outcomes of the evaluations and build what out what the architecture will look like when we're actually trying to achieve those business outcomes. So this may involve designing new systems or products, building new services, establishing new processes and so on in order to achieve those business outcomes and hit those objectives. So let's look at an example in Radha's case. So again, she was working for an insurance company and her reporting of cross-domain analysis led to the prioritization of maturing and modernizing the capability of linking policies of married policyholders. Now in the current state, the customers must call the help center, which must put in a ticket for the policy data to be updated in multiple places. But in the target state, we want to enable mobile policy linkages. So to support this, marriage certificates need to be captured in a mobile app, which must be camera compatible. The information has to be captured in a system and evaluated via a process that might be helped along with artificial intelligence. Now, with that logical architecture in place in the target state, we do have that separate from the current state. So they're side by side in the same repository, but the target state is not getting in the way of our current state processes. It is separated out in a way where we can compare them side by side. And because of this, we can go further to make sure that the changes are fully thought out. 
So once the logical architecture is in place, we can plan out the technologies to support the mobile app, to capture and store the images and data generated. We can assign roles to the processes and provide supporting infrastructure where needed. And by documenting these changes, the target state becomes an actionable architecture connected with traceable links across purposes and domains. This enables KPI-driven comparison of target and current state and provides a blueprint for planning and implementing changes. Of course, this needs to be communicated out in order for us to be able to make those changes happen. And we all know communication is key for the, uh, the role of the enterprise architect, but I would like you to envision communication in a slightly different way. So McKinsey found that architects need to move away from PowerPoints that emphasize just structure and systems to focus instead on understanding the language of business, scenarios, P&L impact, ROI, risk, trade-offs, and so on. Let's recall the principles that we laid out earlier. We need to communicate according to the needs of our audiences. And that means understanding what information they need, when it needs to be delivered to them, which communication formats are easiest for them to use, and who they need to report this information to. Let's take a closer look at how Radha leveraged this and understand how you can apply it in your practice. So Radha paid attention to the reports and the practices that were already in place and the processes surrounding them. So she paid attention to the what, the when, the who, and which formats. And she was able to see how they could be replicated using an EA tool where the information could have value and more connectivity. Specifically, for example, she paid attention to when the capability strategy report was communicated. It was delivered annually as a presentation during strategy planning. And she found that that presentation could be replaced with a reporting dashboard. If the dashboard was still presented live at that time and provided the information that that audience needed. For some audiences and some kinds of information, leveraging the reporting side of your EA tool as a live presentation tool will be most effective. And let's take another example. Walking high level decision makers through risks and their mitigation strategies might be something that is expected to take place as part of a meeting so that there is discussion, that there is opportunity for discussion and reflection. If you replace this with pure self-service reporting, you won't be serving your audience's needs. But if you can replace a static PowerPoint with dynamically presenting real-time information in a dashboard, you're adding value and you're enabling the conversation to move deeper as you can go deeper into the data based on where the conversation heads. Radha also thought about which formats would suit her audiences. For self-service dashboards, this may mean making it highly accessible by embedding it in Confluence, SharePoint, or MS Teams, as we see here for this app portfolio dashboard. Choosing which formats should also consider how users will be interacting with the reports. For example, this view in this technology portfolio dashboard makes filtering to the right information easy. We have the views that make easy clicking. So that pie chart, that, by, that bar chart, users can simply click on the information that they need and it will filter right to that. And that makes this dashboard function really well as a self-service reporting tool. Radha also carefully considered what information in the existing reports was needed by the audiences that access them. For example, this dashboard, which acts as a project report, includes all the visuals that the audience needs in one place and shares project specific details and ties it into strategic information and application and technology evaluations. 
This reporting dashboard also brings in the information that is needed to make a roadmap communication complete. Costs, resources, timelines, and impacts, as well as metrics. Metrics help us to show what information our audiences want. These key metrics move us beyond an IT concern, beyond something that's just about structure, to a discussion of how a change contributes to increased revenue, to market and competitive advantage, how it reduces risks, or how it improves customer or productivity metrics. If we use metrics well, then we can move something beyond just an ID concern to a concern of the wider enterprise. So now it's your turn to repeat these steps that we saw that Rata took in order to be successful as an enterprise architect that was just starting out. So let's review what steps she followed. One, she identified her audiences and their needs, and she looked at what was happening in the moment as well as what those audiences were saying they needed in order to deliver on their needs. She leveraged frameworks. This saved a lot of time and accelerated her process, but she also didn't stick to just a single framework. She made sure that the frameworks that she was using were working for her and her team instead of adjusting everything that they were doing just to be fitting into a single framework. She enabled collaboration, setting the stage for her users to collaborate well using the structure that they were comfortable with and with guardrails in place. With this, she was able to build a flexible repository that included data and also allowed users to contribute data through diagrams and leverage data in diagrams for communication. She also analyzed that data and communicated out her findings. So the analysis done with algorithms and target states and all of that found an audience through effective communication, again, because she considered what her audience's needs were. Now, a big part of this was using an enterprise architecture tool for that central repository. And here are a few things that you might want to consider if you are thinking about expanding into an EA tool. So having it, with the, having it have the ability to do modeling work, and making it configurable so you can configure the meta model, expand frameworks, combine frameworks as needed. Those are all very helpful, as is the ability to integrate with other tools to import data from different sources. And of course, collaboration is key to bring all of those users together. Analysis and reporting is also very important, as we saw, so being able to have different ways of doing analysis, flexibility in the types of algorithms that can be done, being able to do impact and gap analysis and difference reporting between architecture states, and of course, reporting that out effectively to a wide audience with a variety of visuals and dynamic reporting. And of course, you want someone that's going to be able to provide support throughout the deployment process and the implementation steps. And this can help you mature your EA model. So hopefully now you have a little bit of a better idea of what that might look like and just an example in mind of how someone can go from this very first stage of maturity and start to mature up their enterprise architecture practice, even when there isn't a lot in place at the moment. So thank you so much for listening today, and I will open it up for Q&A. Thank you so much, Karina, for that uh, very incisive look. And um, at the Abacus tool, uh, that was actually one of the questions is what was the tool that's being used? And I'm assuming it is Abacus, obviously. Yes, it is Abacus yeah. uh, from Evolution. Yes. And I think if you go back to slide 54, it gives the link in the bottom of that slide for um, how to access uh, more details. So is it the one? That's the one there. Yeah. So a couple of people were asking. So if you could leave that one up while we, we take the questions, that might be helpful. Sure. Okay. Um, we had a few questions come in. I'll, I'll go back to the beginning. Um, the first one here is uh, you had four suggestions on how to ensure data remains current and trustworthy. 
Were these drawn from any framework or guidance that we can use to add weight to these suggestions? Yeah, so the suggestions in this case uh, were really taken from um, users, from enterprise architects that we spoke to, um, uh, I believe in a, a conference setting, um, and understanding what some of their keys for success were based on their actual experience. Um, so I'm sure that um, different frameworks and approaches would bolster these. They might talk about them in a little bit of a different way, but just off of the top of my head, or at least regarding those slides specifically, um, that had to do with us reaching out to enterprise architects who had found those strategies to be successful. Right, okay. Um, another question came in, how do you decide when to not add data, such as an attribute, because the attribute is only useful to a small subgroup of people? Yeah, so, a key part of that is considering how it's going to be updated. So if that small group of people is going to be able to keep that up to date within your EA repository, then I think it's still a great idea to add it. Another key question is whether the reporting of that attribute for that small group would still be occurring within um, or using the EA tool. And if that's going to be the case, if you can assign that ownership and have those users work in the tool, even if it's just as very light users, maybe a catalog editor, then that's still a great path forward because if they have need for that, then you are serving an audience's need. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got another qu question from the same person, um, maybe slightly related. Should you purge data that has not been validated within a reasonable period of time? Um, Purging data that hasn't been validated can be a good idea. Um, sometimes it's easier to set up a data review. So that goes back to that idea of having those housekeeping sessions. So rather than getting rid of data, you might want to consider, does it make sense to pull in these data owners, even if that does mean having a meeting with them to get that back up to date. Um, if that data is connected to other parts of the repository, that might be a better way to go about it. But if it's something that might be better off just pulled fresh from another system or otherwise um, started fresh, um, that might be a better approach to take. So it's going to depend a bit on the situation, but I would definitely consider um, whether you can have uh, time to make sure that it is updated with the data owners if they can be identified. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, we have another one here. How do you recommend getting started with an EA tool? Do you have any tips on getting quick internal adoption? Mm. Yeah, so with internal adoption, it is really key to set the stage for your, your users. So I talked about that a little bit in terms of having the structure in place. But I think if you have the diagram types ready to go, if you're talking about diagrammers, or if you have the portfolio views ready to go, if you're talking about portfolio editors, that goes a really long way. And then the next step is to train them within those views specifically. So you're not just vaguely pointing them towards using a brand new tool, but instead you're guiding them through specifically how they, as an individual on their team with their objectives, will use that tool to do their job. So saying, to do your job to create solution architecture diagrams or to update your application data or whatever it may be, you will use these views and build it out in this way. And giving them that full map of this is how this tool is going to work for me, this is how I'm going to interact with this tool, that really helps them to be confident. And then the other side of that is showing them the value. So that usually means showing them the reporting that's possible once they're working within an EA repository, showing them the query ability, the algorithms, the dashboards. When they see that the work that they do builds out something that adds a lot more value than if they were to just put that diagram where they're used to putting that diagram, if it's PowerPoint or Visio or whatever else, when they see that added value, that also gives them that additional motivation to actually work in the tool. 
Okay, great. Thanks. Um, you actually mentioned training there, and that was one of the other questions. And this is specifically for Abacus. And somebody mm -hmm. asked, how can I find Abacus training? I guess they go to Evolu Evolution's site. Do you have your training providers up on, on your site? Um, so most of the training is provided by consultant, by Evolution consultants. And so that's built into the packages and the training that we actually offer um, as part of those packages is also following the principles that I just described. So we don't go in and just to generically train and then leave you to it. Rather, our training programs, even the, the shorter training programs are really oriented around the individual organization's needs and objectives. So our trainers um, are really consultants and our consultants go in and help to set up a framework. Um, so set up the meta model using the frameworks, combining the frameworks, making any modifications as needed, helping with some initial data imports, and also helping to train those wider users in the way that they will be using Abacus. So training those wider users on um, the tool itself, but also on the actual model, the actual repository that they will be using. And so um, that's our approach to training. First, we do also have some other resources, a knowledge portal, a learning management system, and so on um, to bolster that approach as well. Um, but you can uh, certainly learn more about that from our website or by contacting someone um, from our team. Okay, great. Thanks, Karina. Um, here's another one that came in. Um, what do you consider the main differentiators between Abacus and its Gartner Magic Quadrant competitors, including iServer and BizDesign? Sure. So, uh, configurability is really a key one. So, while other tools might um, say that they are configurable, oftentimes that configurability really relies on someone from their team going into the back end and making some changes that are kind of a big deal to make. But that's not how Abacus works. With Abacus, everything is fully configurable in the meta model. It's right there in the user interface, and we're very open about making sure that our customers are understanding how to make those configurations. And that means that they can make a small change, like adding in a property to be able to ca capture data exactly as they want to capture it in a way that really aligns internally with what their audiences already say or expect to hear. That could also mean something like combining frameworks together, pulling in frameworks so, again, they can provide that stage for their uh, collaborators uh, to work exactly as they'd like to do with the structure um, in place that they need. So there are certainly some other um, differentiators, but that is the big one. Another one that I'll um, say is uh, data, data driven and diagram driven. So Abacus is really a tool where you could go in and never diagram for one second in Abacus. And as we discussed, you can still use auto-generated diagrams. You can still produce diagrams as visuals, but you could approach it in a fully data-driven way. Or you could come at it as someone who is very diagram-driven, all about the solution architecture diagrams, all about the process diagrams, and so on. And either way that you approach it, you're building out a repository, you have data that you can produce visualizations from, that you can produce reports from. Um, and so there's just real true flexibility and a true central repository approach when you're working with Abacus. Okay, thank you. Um, going a little bit more into technical detail here, it's um, we have a question saying, other than using an intermediary repository like ServiceNow or CMBD, what options for importing technology components does Abacus provide for cloud platforms, e.g. from AWS Config? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, Abacus does have a REST API, so that does open a up a lot of possibilities for being able to pull in data directly um, from uh, cloud platforms into Abacus. So we don't have anything that is built out out of the box, but that is a capability that has been um, developed by specific users of the tool, leveraging that REST API. So that is absolutely something that Abacus can support. Okay, great, thank you. 
Um, and the final question, I think that's coming. I mean, there was one saying how Abacus is different from Biz Design Horizon, but I think you covered that in your earlier answer. Um, but there's one here that says you showed a project element. Uh, does this replace other project management tools or work in tandem with them? Yeah, so um, we have Abacus users who follow each of those approaches mentioned. Um, we certainly have Abacus users that leverage Abacus in lieu of a project management tool, capturing project components, uh, labeling them under portfolios, capturing lifecycle dates, and connecting to impacts. Um, and the ability to have web-based editors in catalogs, as well as the ability to produce Gantt charts, really goes a long way in supporting them in using Abacus in that way. But we also have plenty of Abacus users that leverage Abacus alongside a project management tool, either pulling over the project information or just working alongside it with more of a focus in Abacus on the way that the project is being implemented more from a technical level. So both approaches are perfectly valid and both approaches are uh, used by our users. Okay, fantastic. Well, I think that's it, Karina. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Um, the questioners certainly gave you <laughs> pretty much threw everything at you. So, um, uh, as I said earlier, you can find out more information if, if people look at the Evolution um, Feature Comparison Enterprise Architecture Tool uh, link on the bottom of this slide here. And I should mention this session is being recorded um, and the recording and the slide deck will be made available towards the middle of next week and that can be accessed in the Open Group Library. There's no charge for accessing the Open Group Library. You just have to, to log in and you can get access to all of our previous webinars. So thank you again very much indeed, Karina Ahmed, and thanks everybody for, for joining the webinar today. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thanks.